Good afternoon, everybody. This is the uh, last session of the day on the multi-cluster track. So anybody been in here for the whole day doing all the multi-cluster sessions? No? All right, that's fine. <laughs> uh, who here has more than one cluster in production? OK, quite a few, quite a few. Uh, who has uh, more than five? All right, 10? Fewer? Uh, 50? Cool. Uh, uh, 100? Wow, all right. Uh, so whether you raised your hand uh, at 100 or you didn't raise your hand at all, this talk is meant for you. Uh, this is all about you know, how we deal with multiple clusters and scaling an application from one cluster to two, to 10, to 100, and all the way up to 1,000. And that's a lot of ground to cover in half an hour, essentially. So we're going to talk at a pretty high level. There are a lot of talks today in this room that have gone into the lower levels about, OK, how do we do networking between two clusters? I want to talk from an architecture perspective. If you are building an application that requires more than one cluster, either today or in the near future, then I'm hoping I can answer some questions for you, or at least tell you what questions to ask. So if you signed up for this talk uh, last week, you probably saw Cisco on, uh, <laughs> on the schedule. I'm not at Cisco anymore. Um, I, I've been there for 10 years, and I'm, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I'm now at Oort, O-O-R-T. Uh, it's short for Oort Cloud. Uh, uh, co-founder and CEO, along with my, my good friend Adam in the back of the room. Uh, we're building uh, solutions around uh, cloud native edge computing, but this is not a sales pitch, and although I am the CEO, I will refrain from going into details. If you want to hear about ORT, feel free to come up after. I'll put the email address on the last slide. I would love to talk to you about it. All right, so what's the deal with the name? Uh, clusters all the way down. So that comes from turtles all the way down. Uh, if you imagine that your application is the world, and the turtle is the cluster, and your application is sitting in the cluster. Most of us just sit on one cluster today. But if you imagine the need for many clusters, you can always imagine you know, that, that turtle sitting on a bigger turtle, on a bigger turtle, on a bigger turtle, and it's clusters all the way down. So a, a loose analogy. But the, the other part of that analogy that I like is, uh, is the turtle part. So uh, I'll tell you a little story. So this is an allegory, right? Uh, we have a, a pet turtle named Nanny at home. Um, one day I was in San Jose, which, if you know Cisco, that's, that's where you go. Um, my wife sent me a message saying that uh, she had taken the kids to go visit uh, a neighbor's house, and they were giving away a, a red-eared slider, which is an aquatic turtle. So that was two years ago. Fast forward to a couple weeks ago, I come home early from work, walk into the kitchen, and uh, see the picture that you see before you, which is Nanny on the floor. She's an aquatic turtle, remember this. So she's supposed to be in a tank of water, all dried out on the floor, kind of limping along. And the hope is that we get to somewhere in between your cluster limping along, supporting one application, and your turtle cruising through space on a pile of other turtles. So somewhere in there, uh, you know, we, we hope to find some kind of balance. Uh, today, Kubernetes is great for cluster management. We all know that. Uh, but we all know that Kubernetes itself isn't really meant for multi-cluster management. It's, uh, it's a great tool for cluster management. It does one thing and does one thing really well, well, maybe more than one thing. Uh, but for multi-cluster, there are a bunch of other issues. Whether you're at two clusters or 100 clusters, there are issues that we need to talk about that need solutions and that we're going to talk about today. By the end of this talk, I'm hoping that I can instill in all of you a little bit more multi-cluster confidence than you had coming into this. So over the course of the next 30 minutes, uh, we'll be going from one cluster all the way up to 1,000, starting from the beginning. So going from one cluster to two clusters. So first of all, and I'm going to ask this question at every stage of the game, is why? And this is the same question you should ask your product managers or the people who are giving you your requirements is, why are we going from one cluster to two clusters? And there are a lot of reasons. But the most common one is usually, I'm running in US East, or I'm using, running in US West. I want to run in the other one. And why is that? Uh, th that doesn't answer the question of why. That's a kind of a how response. Uh, it, it, is it scalability? Does having two data centers nationally actually give you any additional scalability? And I, I posit probably not. The reason why you're doing that is, that is for catastrophic failure, right? It's for high availability. You finally got that customer who's going to write you the check. But before they do that, they need high availability, enterprise-grade availability. Great. So 
some of you might be angry at this point because I'm conflating clusters with regions or cells. Uh, that's fine, you can be angry. Uh, but we'll come back to this later. So for now, bear with me, the assumption that one cluster to one region. Okay, high availability, one to two. What are the issues? So what is so hard about this? Why, why can't we just do this out of the box? Well, for one, your application probably wasn't designed for two clusters. It, it was designed for one region, right? That's what you did out of the box, that was easy. Uh, what do you do now? Now that you have two clusters, which parts of your application are gonna run on US East and which parts are gonna run on US West? So one strategy you could take, and this is a pretty basic strategy, it might be just fine from going from one to two clusters, is cloning everything. Same microservices that you have in US East can run just as well in US West. And so you have you know, so something that looks like this. And for one to two, you know, that, that's a per, uh, perfectly reasonable strategy. Uh, and we'll see where that breaks down as we, as we go along, but, but for now, let's go with it. Uh, issue number two, when you go to two clusters, is okay, now your data isn't just in one data center, it's actually in multiple data centers. So are you putting every database record in both? Are you doing full replication? Uh, are you using an object store, are you using a database? So this question about how is your data shared across data centers needs to be answered. And so if you look at the CNCF, we've got, uh, we don't have a lot of options, we have Vitesse, right? That, that's a good option. Uh, we've got other open source projects that handle this. For the most part, if you're running in a, in a cloud platform like AWS, you can rely on the AWS toolbox. So each one of these services, like S3 for example, if you Google S3 uh, geo-redundancy, you'll get answers for different options for replicating data between uh, regions. Same thing for DynamoDB or any of these other ones. There's always some strategy there that needs to be investigated. And same thing for Google. You know, they have a similar offering where you can use their cloud storage and then rely on them for geo-redundancy. So it, it's really an architectural choice about, okay, are you going to depend on a cloud provider or are you going to pretend, uh, depend on the CNCF and, and, and their toolbox? So which toolbox are you going to pick? That's first. And then second, how are you gonna use it for geo-redundancy? And your answer for one to two data centers might be different from two to 10. All right, moving quite along. Um, load balancing. Uh, so some people might argue that load balancing isn't a problem here. You're not trying to balance load between data centers. You're really trying to route traffic to the closest data center. So this is an issue now for your multi-cluster application. So how is traffic shared across multiple clusters. How do you, if I'm standing here in Seattle, how does my laptop know to hit US West rather than US East? And you know, again, we can reach into the AWS toolbox and pull out their global load balancer and reach into the, the, the Google uh, toolbox and, and, and pull out their load balancer. Or you could build something custom, you know, built on core DNS, or you could go buy a solution from one of the global load balancing companies. The, the options are out there, but suffice to say, you need an answer for all three of these problems, these issues, to get to two clusters. And are these the only three issues that you need to solve? No, of course not. Uh, but these are the three biggest things. So how do you design your application topology? How do you break down your microservices and decide what runs where? And how do you decide how your data is shared? And then third, how do you decide where your traffic is shared? So just you know, really basic building blocks from going to, from one to two. Now, let's make it harder. How do you go from two clusters to 10. And before we do that, before the how, come back to the why. Why are we going from two to 10 clusters? What's the point? Well, usually when this is happening, it, 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 it's for uh, a reason that your, your, your application is going global, right? You, you, your applications become popular outside of your country. You need to have global presence. Uh, and you might imagine that your product owner comes along and says, hey, you know, our application is operating great in Seattle, uh, but the latency in Asia is killing us, and the folks in Europe hate having their data in American locations, uh, so we gotta do something about this. So the two uh, really driving forces here are really user experience. To go from two to 10, it's user experience, and it's security, and, it, and it's data sovereignty. So let's go back to our issues. Uh, what does the application topology look like? Well, could you clone everything again? You could clone everything again. Uh, should you have a full mesh replication where you share every single database record and every single object in every location? The obvious answer to these questions is no. So what is the answer? Um, and so I would posit, and, and this is the first concept that I'm bringing in, 
uh, is a hierarchical topology. And when we say crazy multi-cluster topologies, that's a bit of a hyperbole. What we're really referring to is these hierarchical topologies where you're designing that something that looks more or less like a tree. It maybe has multiple roots, but it's more or less like a tree. And at the roots of that tree are your data, and at the leaves of that tree are your users. So let's take an example. We could take those clusters and rather than cloning everything, instead arrange them something like this. So we break up the world, divide up the world into Americas, Europe, and Asia Pacific, and then each of those locations have an active data center where your data is, maybe have a standby data center that you can fail over to, and then any other data centers in those regions, they can be more cache only or stateless data centers for your microservices. Uh, and deciding, okay, which regions or which data centers should be active, which should be standby, and which should be stateless, that, those are really important design decisions to make as you scale from two up to 10. Uh, traffic routing remains a problem, and the solutions remain largely the same. You need a global load balancing solution. And then there are new issues, ones that we didn't talk about with two clusters. So service discovery. Uh, there are tools out there like Istio, right, where you know, we, we can use that for discovering other services within a cluster, we can use Envoy. Uh, what about when we have multi-cluster? So multi-cluster Istio is coming, but does it exist today? Uh, some folks in the you know, cloud native architecture space posit that message queues are the right way to decouple applications, and that's reasonable. And you could use something like NATS to create a globally scalable decoupled message queue for doing pub sub of information from one microservice to another. Uh, or you could rely, again, on the Google or the, or the Amazon uh, toolbox. And just an aside here, I don't mean to exclude the, the Microsoft toolbox. I, I know that's just as valid, um, but there are only so many slides and so much time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, what's another issue when we get to 10? So it might have been the case that for two clusters, you were just fine having a separate logging and monitoring stack for each of those clusters. And somebody had to look at two tabs on the browser and it was a pain in the neck, but it was manageable. Now that you're at 10 though, that's no longer cool. You need to start aggregating your metrics and your logs, you need to start filtering them. So what, what are your options there? Well, you can rely on the Google toolbox, but I, I really want to offer praise for what Prometheus has done here in terms of leading the way around out of the box supporting federation and supporting the ability to layer Prometheus on top of each other. Same thing with Fluent. You can forward from Fluent to Fluent and, and filter along the way so that your application topology can be mimicked or made analogous with your Fluent D or Prometheus topology. So your, your Prometheus servers at the edge can export metrics up to the core and you can create nice centralized dashboards, which, which is really good. That's what we want is hierarchy. Uh, another issue you might run into when you hit 10 is, is networking. So, I hope that this is not an issue. I hope that most of us aren't making assumptions about the layer two nature or even the layer three nature of our applications, but some applications are just designed that way. Uh, you have tools like VPC from Amazon and, and Google that can span multiple clouds, and then you can finagle things like Calico or Flannel to create a overlay network. But for the most part, I would posit or suggest that you, you should avoid trying to uh, combine networks across regions like this if you can, and treat each region more like an um, autonomous unit with its own uh, ingress capabilities. Okay, so uh, let's call it 10 complete. You know, again, of course, those aren't all the issues, but all that we have time for today, let's go to 100. And again, why? And before we answer why, I wanna go back to that assumption that we had earlier. So, what if you wanted more than one cluster per region? Maybe that's the reason why you're going to 100. Uh, and I would say that the reasons for doing that, and we'll, we'll get back to the scaling the application to 100 locations, but why might you have more than one cluster per region? Uh, and I was gonna show a topology for each one of these, but you can kind of imagine in your head. So one reason might be you're isolating either teams or resources from each other. Maybe you have a special set of hardware that has special security characteristics or special hardware characteristics. You just don't want it to be part of the, the, you know, the unwashed masses. Uh, same thing for, um, for so grid, grid computing is another example where rather than having one giant cluster that you scale up, instead of scaling up, you start scaling out, right? You've really nailed your configuration for your hardware and your Kubernetes instances for a rack of servers, and then rather than going and back to the drawing board when you go to two racks or four racks or eight racks, instead you, you plop down more clusters. Uh, that, that can be a little bit more scalable, and 
you know, if and when Federation V2 takes off, then, then it might also be vi viable. Uh, and then a third one, so this, this is from personal experience at Cisco, is we typically sell, or Cisco had typically sold to customers who had more resources or were running at a higher scale than Cisco themselves could test at. So we would build a product for a single rack of Kubernetes, we would package that product with Kubernetes, but then when we went to sell it and they wanted to run it on four racks because that was their scale requirement, we wouldn't say, good luck scaling up to four, we've never tried it, that would not go well. Uh, instead we would say, place four of these next to each other. Okay, back to 100, so why 100? Well. Uh, for the most part, it's, it's around performance and scalability. We're, we're, you know, same sort of reasons as, as 10 clusters, uh, but let me give you an example to make it more concrete. Uh, I don't know how many people read the Dropbox uh, blog, but they've had some really nice articles uh, around their edge network. Um, as somebody who's an enthusiast in edge computing, these are, these are really interesting. So if you look at the article from October, uh, they, they kind of describe why and how they've gone from a few pops, points of presence, up to 20 pops and how they've done that. And the, the reasons are really for them, it's all about scale. It's about the amount of data that needs to come in and out of their infrastructure. Uh, they're synchronizing files constantly and moving you know, tons of bits every second from our, you know, our clients, our phones, or our PCs up to the cloud and, and back down again synchronizing those files. So when you hit Dropbox scale or, or greater, you start to have the need for more than just a, a handful of pops. And the same issues apply. These issues don't go away just because you have more, they get exacerbated. But for the most part, the first six that we talked about, they can largely be solved with the same solutions as we use to solve those problems at 10. Is it perfect? No, but it's close. What are the new issues when we hit 100? Uh, I'd say you could maintain 10 CICD you know, deployment parts of the pipeline, but when you get to 100, it gets a little bit unwieldy. So having a unique CI/CD pipeline deploying to each cluster, rather if you, uh, consider this. So consider the concept of resource propagation. Rather than going to each cluster and saying deploy, 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 and making sure that all those are kept into, in sync using your CI/CD tools, use this concept of resource propagation where you deploy to a single root cluster or two root clusters and allow the system to propagate that out from those root clusters. And so if you've looked at Federation V2, uh, which is very, very different from Federation V1, so if that's what's in your head, um, you know, reset on that. Uh, so Federation V2 has this concept of propagation built in, where you can actually template out resources and have those resources propagate through multiple clusters in your topology in such a way that you can deploy once and then allow the system to take it from one cluster to many. Okay, another issue, security. So <laughs> obviously security was an issue for one cluster, uh, but I would argue that the issues at one cluster are similar to 10 clusters, but at 100 clusters, we now run into this new security problem, which is that I can't trust 100 clusters. I don't care who they came from or where they are, I can't trust 100 clusters. I might be able to, you, you could convince me to trust 10 clusters, but 100 is a step too far. So the solution here is, is not exactly simple, but you need to limit trust and access to just your core clusters. So to do this, it's important to identify you know, what are the crown jewels uh, of, your, of your application, where is the most important data, never put you know, your root certificates at the edge or in, in these 100 clusters, always consider what belongs in those core trusted clusters and those 100 semi-trusted clusters. You have some level of trust, otherwise you wouldn't run code there, but you need to decide, okay, there's, a, there's kind of a fuzzy middle here, so maybe be a little bit more careful about where data is put and where secrets are kept. Uh, another issue that we run into, um, who's, hit in, who's hit scalability uh, problems with, with Docker Hub? Anybody? Some, okay. Uh, that's something that we used to run into a lot, actually. I know it's gotten better over time, um, but if you're deploying directly from Docker Hub, that can be a single point of failure uh, in some ways. And what you'd like to do is almost optimize deployment of your images to follow the path of your data or the path of your application. So as you propagate applications out to these clusters in all far corners of the world, you also want to be propagating out the images that underlie those containers. And so using tools like Harbor or taking image registry and setting up in a caching topology is actually something that we've done in the past uh, in order to get better scalability out of image deployment and artifact caching. 
All right. So let's say that 100 is complete. Again, if you were to do this, no guarantees that solving these issues would be enough, but good enough for now. Let's talk about 1,000. So why in the heck would anybody deploy 1,000 clusters? And remember, I'm assuming one cluster per region here. So why in the heck would somebody deploy to 1,000 locations, each running a Kubernetes cluster? What could be the reason for that? So one of the favorite blog posts in the IoT Edge working group uh, is, is this one, where Chick-fil-A uh, team posted about what they had done with each one of their, their 2,000 plus stores, running Kubernetes in each one of them on a, on a three node NUC cluster. And this kind of illustrates one of the reasons why you might have plus 1,000. Uh, it, it, it's really at this point about being on premise. It's really about these things. Latency, so actually having a really low latency between a device and the back end that's serving it, or something that produces a lot of bandwidth, uh, or something that requires a high level security and privacy, or something that needs survivability, right? Uh, you think about survivability requirements, you think about like a, a hospital, right? If the uplink for the hospital goes down, hospital still needs to operate. A uh, restaurant is not life and death, but the business would prefer if the restaurant kept operating if the uplink went down. So, a good example of all these things is IoT, and specifically IoT video. So if you imagine like, okay, I have a, uh, a video camera that's monitoring a robot in a factory, I need really low latency and a high level of bandwidth and security and privacy and resiliency for that particular modality. And a lot of this starts to look like, and this might just be me, but everything to me looks like edge computing. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this looks a lot like edge computing. Um, there's no way that those thousand clusters are public cloud regions. There just aren't that many of them. You, at this point, are no longer just doing cloud computing. You are doing cloud computing and edge computing, and there's a whole set of requirements and tools to help you do that, and also a ton of gaps currently in that space. And one of the issues that uh, we, we think about at ORT uh, is scarcity. So one of the characteristics of, of edge computing uh, isn't just being at the edge, which is kind of a nebulous term anyway. It, it, it's also being in a resource-constrained environment where you don't have a limitless font of compute resources available to you like you do in AWS US East. Instead, you have a, a smaller set. Maybe it's just those three NUCs, right? Maybe it's half a rack, but resources are scarce and you need to deal with it. So does that mean that you should clone every microservice and run them everywhere? Or should we be more intelligent? So I, I bring up this final concept, which is multi-dimensional auto-scaling. Um, so we, we all know about scaling up and scaling down. That's one of those things that Kubernetes is really good at. You can scale up the number of pods, you can scale down the number of pods. Uh, but what about scaling out and scaling back? So if you're using that number of clusters, do you need to run every microservice in every location all the time? or? Could you actually use some type of metric to decide, okay, I'm seeing a ton of traffic coming to, to you know, sketch.com from Seattle because you know, 8,000 people just flew in there and they're accessing the sketch website. Uh, maybe we could place some of our resources, maybe the, you know, the front end server or authentication pieces out in the edge that's in the Seattle location. And so you now no longer have to operate in one dimension scaling up and down, you can now operate in two dimensions. I can decide, okay, more load, I can either scale up where I am, or I could actually scale out closer to the user. So it gets interesting. All right, uh, a lot of more issues at 1,000, but let's just call that complete, because you know, as I said, we don't have a ton of time. What about 1,000 to 10,000? And I don't yet have an example for this, and if somebody does, you know, please come after and I'd love to talk to you about it, but to me, this is more of a future. And we still need to identify you know, why, why 10,000 might be necessary and what kind of tools would be necessary. Uh, okay, so let's bring it back, wrap it up. Over the past 25 minutes, we've gone from one cluster to two, to 10, to 100, to 1,000. Uh, we've talked about these at a cursory level. Um, I'll be the first to admit this is a fairly high level talk. Um, I haven't given you the details about how to do a lot of this, just the what and the what questions to ask, so I'm sorry for that. Uh, but we've made it from one to 1,000. And this is just to summarize it. So we talked about application topology, and that's probably one of the most important ones along with number two. When you're designing your application, you need to think about the topology, not just within the cluster of what microservices talk to what other microservices, but how do you take those microservices when you go global and distribute them to many clusters? 
Same thing with the data. Where does the data live? What parts of the data live where? How is it replicated? What's your consistency story? What's your availability story for the data? Traffic routing, there are some tried and true methods there. Service discovery, uh, as I said, you know, maybe Istio will catch up there, uh, but maybe in the shorter term you use something like Nats or, or Amazon's uh, queuing service. Logging and monitoring, uh, we talked about things like Prometheus, networking, we talked about VPCs for CICD, we talked about the concept of maybe adopting Federation, uh, Federation V2. For security, we talked about whittling down the number of clusters that you trust. Image distribution, we talked about actually creating a caching hierarchy, almost like a CDN for image distribution. And then finally for scarcity, we talked about this concept of multidimensional autoscaling. And along the way, we kind of developed these concepts of hierarchical topology. This is probably the most important one when you're thinking about applications that span clusters. Always think about hierarchy. What's at the root of my tree? What's that data? What's at the, what are the, at the leaves of the tree and what's in between? Resource propagation, so rather than touching many points in the network, instead we're touching uh, one point and propagating out, and then multi-dimensional auto-scaling, I can now scale out and back in my hierarchy, hierarchy and not just up and down within a single cell. And then finally, you know, rule of thumb, every step along the way, the question we asked was why? Why do we go from one to two, two to 10, 10 to 100, and 10 to 1,000? And unless you can answer that question, that why question with absolute certainty, or at least uh, some level of certainty, you probably don't want to take that jump. So never use more clusters than you need, and unless you can answer that why question, maybe you don't need it. Okay, so uh, a couple minutes left here. I hope I've instilled in you a little bit more multi-cluster confidence so that as you're scaling from one to 1,000, uh, you feel good about what issues you'll need to address. Uh, as I promised, uh, I'll tell you a tiny little bit about ORT. Uh, so if you're interested, you can go to ORT.io. Feel free to uh, give us your email. We won't spam you. We've got a terms of service on there. Um, we are currently in stealth mode. And uh, right now, just providing consulting around edge computing. So how do you go from one to 1,000 clusters uh, for low latency use cases and for high bandwidth use cases? So if that's of special interest to you, or if you're particularly interested in how do you go from one to two to 10 to 100 to 1,000, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, you can email us here at hello at ort.io. Um, if you'd like to schedule some time with me or my team, uh, I'll be available all day tomorrow. That's our calendar link. Uh, you're welcome to do that. And it looks like we have a little bit of time for Questions. So, any questions? Yes, sir, in the back. The Internet of Things for 10,000 clusters. Yeah, I suppose I could see that. Uh, so the, the comment was, uh, you know, the answer for why 10,000 clusters might be obvious, and that by, might be the Internet of Things, where in every home and every location and every telephone pole, you now have a cluster. Uh, serving, you know, serving data or processing data. Other questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Right, how do you deal with a single point of failure problem? So uh, it's important to treat every cluster as expendable, essentially. So you might have 10 clusters, but you can't rely on any single one of them. Any single one could, could go down, and that kind of has to be built into your architecture. There's another question up here? What if I have less than one cluster per region? Okay. Yeah, so in general, at least what, what we've discovered is that r running like meta clusters or trying to take a single cluster and span it across multiple regions just has never gone well for us. So we, we've avoided it. If somebody gets that working, I know there's people who try to make it look like clusters span multiple regions. Uh, it, it's interesting, but it, it's, it's not the approach that we've taken. Anybody else? Yes. How do you factor in data pinning? How do you factor in data pinning? Right, right. Uh, so, for example, for like data sovereignty, where you might want to keep it in one particular region. Yeah, uh, so I imagine that would need to be managed kind of at that database layer. Uh, you would need policies at that database saying, okay, these set of records we need to stay in this location. I imagine that, so say you need to keep something in Germany, you would almost need to have two data centers or clusters in Germany for the reasons of, of failover. So data pinning almost always would necessitate not just one, but, but two. Anybody else? Um, yes, way in the back. So I think the question was, how do you deal with synchronizing deployments of applications across clusters? Yeah. 
Oh, of deployment versions. Right, so th the hope is that Federation V2 can, can solve some of those problems for you. Uh, where you, you, as you're rolling out new uh, versions of your resource templates, those are kind of slowly propagating out through the network. But knowing what's actually been deployed and having observability, I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. Other, other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Right, so the question was, if you're going to propagate resources out from a single root point, uh, don't you have a single point of failure? Uh, that diagram was kind of misleading. You'd ideally want to propagate out from at least two root clusters and not, not just one. So you could seed an update in both or, or either. Yeah. Uh, yes, over here. Okay, are we talking about uh, like Kubernetes deployment configuration or are we talking about like resource? Uh, applications, the stuff, the stuff running on it that ends up being a little bit different than like Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so one of the nice things about resource propagation is that you're kind of forced to, into a model where you need to start at least from a common root. You can do the templating thing and that could get out of hand, but at least you're starting from, the default is start from having the same thing on every cluster. So uh, hoping that that mental model of resource propagation helps solve that problem. Yeah. Uh, so, kind of follow up on the, uh, uh, on the quality data that you said that the data now might be used for us, but what about like, what if the rack that has died? Then the quality can tell you exactly where the data is going, and there's a new count of racks, right? Yes, good point. So, we're kind of oversimplifying here, and this goes back to like service discovery is that, yeah, you probably have like a default topology. But you almost need to decouple the layers of that topology. So it, it's not quite a tree. It's more like you probably have two things in the root, then a group of multiple things at the mid layer, then a group of like 100 things at the, uh, at the edge. And it's really like an any to any relationship. Yeah. How do you operate the 1,000 clusters? So, <laughs> good question. I, I totally glossed over that. So how do you get to the point of having 1,000 clusters? Um, <laughs> so we had built the tool around you know, deploying and managing across lots of clusters. Uh, there are other companies out there who, who are doing that, uh, but it, it comes down to automation. So can you repeatedly deploy clusters using automation and by, by stamping them out? Uh, we used Ansible to do it. I, you, you could skin that cat almost any way. Okay, uh, one more, yes. Okay, you're, you're asking how you handle multiple cloud providers? Yeah. Okay, uh, right, so a lot of the assumptions I made here were that you're either using AWS or you're using Google. You're not using both, right? Uh, yeah. But if you know if you if you were here early in the day and you saw some like the cross plane stuff from Upbound, you, you you see like the need for working across many different cloud providers. Uh, that gets hard. You almost need a, a layer of abstraction. And to do the global load balancing thing, you almost definitely need to rely on a third party provider, like you know something running in Equinix around the world. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. I really enjoyed our conversation. Have a good evening.